So we're having here in Jesus in the scriptures as uh, Victor was reading from Luke 24. So I just want to rehash and pick up from actually verse 13, if I can get this to work. So uh, just to recap, you know, just briefly to the point I want to get to. Uh, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. So furlongs, uh, what I saw on the internet, is about like 200 meters. So three score, uh, 60 times 200 is about 12 kilometers. So that's a pretty fair walk, right? Uh, 12 kilometers. And so they talked together of all things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Now, I don't know how, in, that, in what case, uh, in that sense, how um, in Mark it talks about how Jesus in another, appeared to them in another form. I don't have that verse here, but and that's how their eyes were uh, holding that they should not know him. So whatever case, they just didn't know it was Jesus. So now he's just, Jesus is just walking with his people, uh, going to Emmaus. And he said to them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And, one of the, and the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? So he's basically saying, like, Are you new here? Have you been living under a rock? You know, Jesus came out of the tomb, obviously. So they're wondering, like, Jesus... Like, or they, they don't know it's Jesus, but they're wondering, like, haven't you heard these things? These things are very commonly known in, in the area of Jerusalem. So his death, burial, and resurrection was very, very, like, public, very, very alert. Everyone knew about it in Jerusalem. And, he's, and so let's go jump to 19. And he said unto them, what things? You know, a bit, bit, bit sarcastic in a sense. You know, he, Jesus knows, obviously. He says, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that he had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. And so he's rehashing that, you know, the following, they've heard of Jesus Christ, they've heard of all the great things he's done, you know, all the miracles, all the healing, the people that rose from the dead. Uh, and that, they thought that he was going to be to redeem Israel. So these, thing, these people, you know, you can see, imagine how upset they are. Someone they were following, they thought, just passed away, you know. And so they continue on. Yea, cert the certain woman also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found that even so as the woman had said, by him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So I wanted to go draw to this verse firstly, in verse 27, but we'll quickly finish off the, the, the section of the passage. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. Past Emmaus, so, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, you know, stay, it's coming, coming to the night, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Now that would have been interesting. Vanished could have been maybe he just went away, or he, and in some, uh, in some my, my thought was like maybe he teleported. That would have been interesting, right? that when they were walking with Jesus, they didn't know it was him. And at this point, they're like, that's Jesus. And then he's out, you know, he's gone. So I'm not sure exactly how that uh, played out, but I just find that as just, uh, Jesus, once they knew him, he went. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he, was talk uh, while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose the same hour, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. So just before we got on, I just like in verse 32 how it says, How that not, did not our heart burn within us? Well, you know, when Jesus was speaking the scriptures, uh, teaching the scriptures to them, and uh, going through the Old Testament, you know, they thought, they felt like their heart was burning with us. They heard the preaching of God's word directly from Jesus. And they felt, they felt, the power of his word. They felt Jesus Christ. 
So I want to jump to verse 27. And, uh, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures as things concerning himself. So the thing with, uh, the thing with Christianity especially, you know, we have uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You know, it's really what separates uh, us to everyone else. You know, there's many things in that, um, in it, that in itself in terms of salvation. But the story itself, the resurrection, you know, many times um, apologists these days, they're using the resurrection as proof that the Bible is reliable, that the Bible is true. And so I want to go through a bit of, of, of this morning, uh, beginning at Moses and the prophets, about Jesus Christ. Obviously, there's many examples. You know, we have a living word. We have the living Bible. We're not going to be able to understand everything. We're just human beings. But I just find the interesting here is Jesus goes through the Old Testament. He's showing himself through uh, the Old Testament. And you know, you, see, you think of many like false Christs these days, false preachers that claim to be Christ. They cannot do this thing. They cannot say, you know, Moses, this was me. This is what happened. This is me fulfilling the law. You know, we know we've heard some of us in our circles, right? We've heard of Tyler Docker. He can't do that. He can't go to Moses. He can't go through the prophets. He can't go to the Psalms. He can't do that. You know, all these false Christs, they can try to claim to be Christ, but they can't be doing what Jesus Christ did here. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, expounding to them all the scriptures concerning himself. So that's why I think this is important, you know, especially the, what it leads up to, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that everything is pointing that Christ will fulfill the scriptures and that he would save us from our sins. So we're going to go through uh, Jesus in the book of Moses. So we think of what Moses wrote. Uh, you know, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books is what they accredit uh, Moses to. He also read a few Psalms. Uh, we'll get to a bit later. But we're going to go through uh, Jesus in Moses' books. Now, there's a lot of examples in Moses' books about Jesus. Obviously, we can't touch as more, as I said. But I wanted to touch on uh, this one in Genesis 14, uh, Melchizedek. So let's have a quick read. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham gave him tithes of all. Not the other way around. So what we see here is actually uh, the first mention of priests, I believe, in the Bible, and it's about Melchizedek. It's a pretty cool name, interesting name. Melchizedek. I've never heard of anyone else named that their child. That would be quite, quite the fascinating story about that. But Melchizedek is what we, um, I believe, or the Bible to teach, that this was uh, Jesus Christ obviously showing himself in the Old Testament. Uh, he was the priest of the Most High God, right? So what he came also, what, what the other elements I want to try to um, bring up is that he brought forth bread and wine. You know, remember in the, Old Test uh, the New Testament, before he was going to the uh, Mount of Olives and, pr and pray, you know, he was obviously had the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, that he brought, uh, he broke bread, and they had the wine. So I find that interesting there, the correlation there. And he was the priest of the Most High God, and Melchizedek uh, blessed Abraham, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So in this passage, actually, uh, Abraham, he just... He just, had a, he just won a battle against various kings. He actually helped Sodom, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's why he gave uh, the tithes of all. But why I believe king, uh, Melchizedek here uh, is um, Christ in the Old Testament. It shows this in, in Hebrews 7. Uh, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to him also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation King of righteousness, and after that also, King of Salem, which is King of peace. And this is why I think um, this is Melchizedek is Jesus in the Old Testament. It says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So that's why I, I believe uh, the Bible to teach that um, Melchizedek is Christ in the Old Testament. You know, we see not only that, there's many obviously examples of uh, Christ in the Old Testament, but this one was I wanted to point to because uh, one, that he's a priest and that he's a king. So we don't really have any, as far as I know, uh, there's no king in the Bible that was also a priest, and there was no priest in the Bible that was a king besides Jesus Christ. 
So it says king of Salem. And if we read that, it says, uh, in verse 2, it talks about, by interpretation, king of righteousness. You know, we, if you think of the millennial reign of Christ, what's going to happen? He's going to tighten the ship. He's going to reign and rule with an iron rod, right? So all the criminals today that, you know, you think of all the, how loose sometimes our criminals are, all the people that, um, you know, the child predators, you know, they, they can, all they need to do is really wear an ankle bracelet and they walk around freely. You know, God would have them put to death. You know, would have a, such a um, clean place. And we think of Jesus Christ, King of Righteousness, that he's going to run a tight ship, that he's going to reign and rule with an iron rod. But I just like the thought that he is also our King, right? Our King, that we serve Jesus Christ, the King, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And not just... You know, we compare it to other religions today. You know, who's Muhammad? Muhammad's nothing compared to Jesus. Who's Buddha? He's nothing. You know, he, he left his family just to live at peace for himself. That's a bit, shouldn't that be a shameful thing? You leave your family to think that you're reaching enlightenment? We have Jesus Christ, not Vishnu, not Krishna. We have Jesus Christ, the King, the King of righteousness. And that's who we are, have today, Jesus Christ. But also, that is the king of Salem, which is king of peace. And once again, you know, uh, I, I think it's in Daniel, you read uh, parts of the millennial reign where you know, animals, they can sleep together. You know, they don't have fear of eating each other and the child can lead them about because there's going to be peace in that thousand years. You know, that's who Christ is. He's going to give us peace. And you think about also what he's given us, our salvation, uh, the peace that passes all understanding. You know, you have your troubles and your struggles in your life today, you know, um, these things should comfort you. you know, it almost heals your arthritis in that sense. You know, wow, one day I'm going to, be, I'm going to have an uh, eternal, like, healthy body without problems. I won't get tired. I won't have to really sleep. Wow, what a, what a time that would be. The King of Peace is who Jesus Christ is, King of Salem. And that is who our God is. So those two things I wanted to bring on, but also that he was also a high priest, it says this in Hebrews 5, uh, regarding Melchizedek, though he were a son, and Jesus Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we don't really have uh, a full detail of what Mel Melchizedek's order was in terms of what did Melchizedek do. That, the, the snapshot we have in Genesis 14, it just shows that he blessed Abraham, Abraham he blessed God, and Abraham, Abraham gave him tithes of all. So there wasn't really much detail, but I'm, I'm guessing as, as we dive a bit into the deep of what priests do, you know, that's basically what uh, Christ was doing. You know, he, was, um, he showed the bread and the wine. He's always probably teaching and bringing people to himself that there is one day there's going to be a savior. And what he did was he broke his body and he shed his blood for you. So as a priest, you know, that's what they did. He was called an high priest, uh, not just a priest. So we'll jump into that a bit. Uh, so in Hebrews 9, it says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tab tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of go uh, goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen? You know, eternal, that's, that shows you that we've saved once and forever, not just temporary redemption. All right, reading on. For the, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an hypha, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So what I wanted to bring up is that Christ, being a high priest, you know, entered into once the holy place in, in, at the top part of there. You know, there's a thing called, the, uh, in, if you read in Leviticus, it talks about the Day of Atonement. And um, basically, I've got this picture here. Um, what I wanted to point out is, you know, this is called the holy place. And, the, and once a year, the, the, um, in the Day of Atonement, the high priest would actually enter into this one, um, the Holy of Holies, to offer that sacrifice for, for himself and the whole congregation, the whole uh, nation of Israel. It says this in Leviticus 16 uh, regarding the day of atonement. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that is, the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. 
For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. So once a year, you know, for everyone else, this is a public holiday, basically, a holy day, a day of rest. It shall be a statute forever. But once a year, this, the high priest, uh, in which this is what Jesus Christ did, you know, he was the high, our high priest. He went to uh, the mercy seat in heaven, which is what the tabernacle is representing here, to sprinkle his blood for us eternally. And this is what he's doing, um, that he made an atonement for us. That one, day, that one time and one sacrifice only, he paid for all of our sins, giving us that eternal redemption. And that's who Jesus Christ is, the high priest. And I, I just like how that correlates when Jesus is teaching about himself in the Old Testament. You know, this is what I did for you. This is what happens when I died, was buried and rose again. I am the high priest, Jesus Christ. This is what he did. High, the high priest, once and forever, paid for our eternal redemption. So I like how that ties into what Jesus Christ did and what it talks about in Hebrews. Uh, let's jump to Leviticus 21. Um, and this is regarding, uh, you know, re remember the Passover lamb, it had to have no blemish, right? Couldn't have spot, couldn't have any problems with it. Uh, the same thing with the priests, uh, high priest. It says this, uh, Aaron being the first high priest, he says, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed and thy gen their generations, that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. So this is quite a list of things, and some of the things are pretty interesting or funny. You've got a blind man, or a lame, you know, someone that can't walk, or he that hath a flat nose. Uh, not sure how flat you have to have a nose to not make it, but a flat nose, or anything superfluous, superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or, uh, you know, a lot of old people would be ruled out there, you know, they, they wake up like, oh, my back, right? Or crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. So I believe Jesus Christ, obviously, he had no blemish in him. Obviously, he had no sins. But physically also, he had no blemish. Um, he shall eat the bread of his God, but both of the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries. For I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And Moses told it unto Aaron and he, to his sons and unto all the children of Israel. So I believe Jesus Christ, uh, as we, in, in many cases, you know, the Passover lamb, that he was our Passover lamb, and he's a high priest, he couldn't have any blemish. He had no sin for himself. Once again, fulfilling the scriptures as Jesus points to the Old Testament. And uh, we see this in John 19 about Jesus Christ. They didn't break his bones. Uh, it says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. So the, the two criminals left and right. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. So that gives us a picture once again that, you know, they didn't break his bones. He had no blemish. Exodus 12, 46, and also Psalm 32, 34, 20, says, In one house shall it be eaten, regarding the Passover lamb, thou shalt not carry forth aught to, of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Um, and in Psalm 34, 20, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. So Jesus Christ fulfilled uh, this uh, in the Old Testament. Now he had no broken bones. He had no blemish. He had no sins. He was a perfect lamb. He was uh, the lamb um, that paid for all of our sins. All right. So you, what I find interesting also is that this sort of, that Christ uh, being the king and also a priest, this sort of filters down to us. Uh, you probably heard in other church circles, you know, the, the priesthood of the believer, that um, all, all believers, all people that are saved, they're actually called priests. Um, it says this in 1 Peter 2.9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of, his, uh, out of darkness into his marvelous light. So if you're saved this morning, uh, the Bible says you are a priest. If you're saved this morning, we're a royal priest and holy nation. You know, we are of, thanks to Jesus, uh, engrafted into the nation. We are um, of the seed of Abraham in the spiritual sense. And we are of chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. Just like Christ, he was 
our high priest, and he is also the king. You know, we are a royal priesthood. Um, if you think about it, you know, sometimes when you, when you know someone special, you know, uh, you think you, you felt uh, you've got um, special treatment because you know someone, right? You always, feel, you always feel blessed, like, oh, I know that person. That feels great. Um, but we have Jesus Christ, the king. You know, he is why we have what we have today. And thanks be to him that we have a royal priesthood. Um, in 2006 and 2007, when I, went, when I went to Philippines at the end of the year with my parents, um, my uncle, who was the colonel at the time, uh, and the way Philippines works is a bit corrupt, obviously, but basically from the airport, once we got out of the plane, uh, I think I've rehashed this story before, but once we got out of this plane, um, you know, we just, there was barely no checkpoints for us. We just had to go with the police escort that he gave us, and we walked through a lot of, we jumped the queue, and um, we just obviously had to show our, our passport and get it stamped off, and just a quick scan, but basically it was just, you know, from the plane to going to our escorted vehicles just outside the, the, the door, it was just like 10 minutes, you know, we got our luggage, our luggage got brought, brought to us, it was, it was quite, uh, I felt special there, but you know, we actually have Jesus Christ, and you know, we, we should feel special that we are of the royal priesthood, that we have Jesus to give praise to, that we have, we're under the Jesus Christ, not just any other person, not just any other false god or devil, but we have Jesus Christ, and nothing else can take that away. But also that we are also of a priest. A priest. We are of the priesthood of the believer. And so it says this in regard, and what does priests do when we think about what we saw, what the high priest died? Basically, you know, you read, remember if you read through Exodus, Leviticus, it talks about what, uh, you know, the sacrifices that priests did, and they bring people to God, right? So uh, ultimately what I'm thinking is that as, as believers, as Christians, and our sacrifices is to live for God. And we'll go through in Hebrews 13, it talks about this. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, thankful people, being a thankful person is offering sacrifice of praise to God. You should always be thankful. The Bible says, you know, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So in everything give thanks. You know, we, we ought to be thanking God for everything. You know, um, you ever deal with people that are unthankful? You always, they always seem to be the grumpy ones, you know. You, even though you're doing something nice for them, they're not thankful, like, they just take it. It just feels like the attitude, like, oh, I did something nice for you, and that's how you treat it. You know, that, you don't want to be the grumpy person. You know, that's why you want to be thanking God and everything, right? You know, it sort of gives me an idea, like, the, the Japanese people, when I was there with my wife in 2018, you know, they're very thankful people. They're, like, the nicest people with very experienced and they're just so kind to each other. The place is so clean, peaceful. You know, the crime rates are low. These people are thankful people, you know. And that's why I think in the Bible, in that sense, that we ought to, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, as Christians, we ought to offer a sacrifice of praise to God. Uh, as priests, as we are priests, uh, giving the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, no matter how hard our trials you go to, uh, you know that song, Count Your Blessings? You know, every time you're going through a hard time, remember when uh, Paul and Silas was in that jail and they sang? You know, they're probably thanking God too. You know, they're offering praises and thanks to God. You know, through the hard times, you're like, God, just thank you for the victories you gave me then. Thank you for the, what, uh, the help that you've given me. Thank you for providing for me this. You know, from the, from the time that you're having troubles and trials and you're thanking God, you know, ought to uplift your spirit. It gives you um, a thinking, a thanking um, spirit that you have peace with it. So we praise God, give praise to God, uh, continually giving thanks to Him, you know. But also that we do not, but to do good, in verse 16, and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So to do good, you know, we, we ought to know the Bible, what it talks about, how to live our lives, and um, how to walk in this world to do good. Not just to think good or pretend to, in, in our word and hear, but to do good, you know, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, as the Bible says in James. You know, we ought to do good. It says this in 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Not just to hear the truth, but to walk in them. So if we look back, you know, but to do good and, and communicate not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So you ought to do good. But also to communicate, right? So what is communicate? Preaching the gospel. You know, I find it interesting that how 
it says to walk in the truth, but in the Bible it talks about our feet shod with the gospel, right? So we're always walking about preaching and communicating uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to do good and to preach about Jesus, you have to do both things, all right? So to be, uh, and that is our sacrifice. So it talks about this in Romans 12, very popular verse, first, uh, two verses. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the revealing of your mind, and that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it tells us, you know, as we are priests, you know, we ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. You know, what are you doing when no one's looking around? What are you doing when no other believers is around you? How are you, how are you about with the, uh, with the world? You know, the Bible says you know, to, to be in the world but not of it, right? So you've got to be holy, be a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God. And the Bible says this is our, just our reasonable service. Reasonable, not, not your, this is what top Christians do. No, this is reasonable. This is something we should be doing. You now, as Christians, we should be going about um, showing Christ through who, our works and how we speak. And that is our reasonable service. And not to be conformed to this world. So we're not to be all obviously um, in, engulfed with things and, and um, fascinated by things of this world. You know, who cares what Elon Musk does and Mark Zuckerberg does, right? Who cares what, um, you know, we ought to obviously know what things happen around the world, but not to conform ourselves to it. You know, get so engulfed into this world and the world of sports, the world of media, the world of uh, games these days, not to be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you, are, you as a Christian, you as a believer, as a priest, being a living sacrifice, you've got to prove what is that good and acceptable perf and perfect will of God. You can't do that if you're conformed to this world. You can't do that when you're speaking like the world. You can't do that when you're lazy, not working hard. You've got to prove what is that good will and acceptable and perfect will of God. Presenting yourself holy, right? Presenting yourself holy. Living clean. So as priests, that's what we ought to do. And um, that's what I, the part of the, um, what I want to draw from in terms of Melchizedek, how he was the king, he was the priest, and that it filters down to us that we are of a royal priesthood and how we ought to live and who we are reminded of Jesus Christ. So if we jump to um, the next part I wanted to speak to, not only in Moses where he was expounding himself, but also in the prophets, right? So we jump back to Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So in all the prophets. Now there's many, now I'm not going to go through every prophet, major and minor prophet in the Bible and how Christ fulfilled it as we don't have the, the whole time to do so. And obviously as, uh, as a man, I, I wouldn't be able to know how to draw um, how ex exactly Christ fulfilled everything. So we'll, ju um, we'll jump through a few. And the main one that I want to bring up is, is like the most um, obvious one would be that Jonah, uh, Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Um, you know what I found interesting? In the past you know, couple, uh, I think in the past hundred years or 150 years already, there's already been accounts of people being swallowed by you know, great whales, great uh, different vary, uh, varying of whales. And it would be... Interesting to hear their story and those guys, the survivors, how they experienced it. But, you know, it just shows to you, like, the world mocks the Bible and say, you know, how can um, someone be swallowed up by a fish? Well, it happened. It's happened in the past hundred years a couple of times. And um, I'm sure we, there's videos of it. I just haven't had a search. But this is where it just shows you that Jesus Christ, um, just like Jonah was in three days and three nights in the whale's belly. It says this in Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's body, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So why the death, burial, and resurrection? It's important. As Christians, that's why we're saved. You know, the death, burial, and resurrection is what we stand on. That Christ, who is God, took our place. And without that, we'd have no salvation. You know, without that, why would we even have church? Why would we be here? For Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection saved, saved us eternally. You know, for us... And, um, 
we have this in 1 Corinthians 15. And, uh, once again, the resurrection is, is now um, used by a lot of, scholars, a lot of you know, debates these days to prove or to show that the Bible is reliable. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, which also you have received, when, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that I, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So the memory verses that we have for the kids. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So they had Scriptures in hand at the time. You know, they knew there was going to be someone that was going to die for their sins and rise again the third day. You know, I think it was Jonah, uh, as we see. Uh, and he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above, sorry, 500 brethren at once. You know, a lot of witnesses there. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So we have the resurrection, and a lot of people think, like, you know, what's the, what's the uh, proof of the resurrection? Is there any reliability? How can we believe the resurrection? You, know, you think about the circumstances surrounding the resurrection, or even the death, you know, and, and uh, if we compare Christianity to Muslims and uh, the book and the Quran, you know, Jesus, he didn't actually die. It was just someone that was uh, made to look like Jesus, and that Jesus actually didn't die. But then one day, uh, then Jesus rose... Uh, ascended. So this is why it's critical that, you know, as Christians, we believe that death, burial, and resurrection of God who saved us, and that, that, is, that is true. You know, why didn't Jesus appear to, you know, Pilate and all those things? I think, I think they've heard of the resurrection at that time. You know, they knew Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was obviously a public figure. Uh, as we saw, you know, Cleopas, he was saying, you know, where, have, have you not heard so much in Jerusalem? And he's talking about, you know, were you not in Jerusalem? Have you not heard of the things in Jerusalem? You know, what Jesus did was common. It was public. There's no denying what happened. That He died, he was buried, and he rose again. You know, you just think about the surrounding events of what happened during his death, which we'll go to. Matthew 27, 19, uh, and Pilate and his wife, when he, when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man, Jesus Christ? For I suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. You know, people, the, once again, you know, I'm just building up the story that around Christ's death, you know, many great things were happening. You know, she had a, a dream. You know, she was scared. And it talked about um, what happened when Jesus Christ died. Jesus, when he cried, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Remember in the Holy of Holies and the holy place in the tabernacle picture I showed you? That, um, I, don't want, I can't jump back to it now, but basically that veil between the Holy of Holies and the, and the Holy Place, got, uh, the veil was rent in twain. So that's what Christ did for us when he, when he paid for our sins, right? But also what happened, the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So when he died, you know, all these miraculous things, these, uh, you know, these things, supernatural things were happening. And, um, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept. So these people that died that were saints that saved, they rose. That, that would have been something, right? That would have spread for sure. You know, you think about how the word got out, you know, people that rose from the dead when he died came and spread the message and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. So you even surrounding his death, you know, people were starting to see and hear of things like, wow, this, this is like, no way he cannot be not the son of God. You know, uh, contrary to what the Muslims believe in the Quran teach, I don't know how they can believe that, that Jesus did not die on the cross. This was a public event. This was as if, you know, the most famous person in the world today died on TV. It, was, it would be like that where everyone knows every, everything was happening. You cannot deny that Jesus Christ died that he died and all these great things were happening, even to people that weren't originally believers, you know? And now when it comes to his resurrection, the same thing, you know? His resurrection is just as strong as his death, you know? That should be to us what proves uh, what, that the Bible is true. Now regarding, um, um, you know, his, his resurrection, you know, when he died, obviously the Pharisees, you know, the, the false religions of that time, 
you know, this is what they're saying. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver, that, that deceiver said while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. And Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as ye can. So they went and made uh, the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So what the Pharisees uh, did, you know, they, they basically got hired security guards. You know, when, you, when you're hiring, like, you know, people to guard something, you don't want, you want, you want to, like, make sure that, you know, you guard this safe. You want to guard um, this thing. They, they, they're obviously going to take into account, you know, who's going to potentially uh, attack or go against us. You know, you wouldn't put a child as a security guard, you know. You wouldn't want to, um, you know, someone that signs up as a security guard, but, you know, they're probably weak and scrawny. You know, you, you're probably not going to get hired, right? So what I'm trying to say is that when they hired... Uh, these guards and these watchmen, you know, they made sure, as, as Pilate said, um, what did it say here? Go your way, make it as sure as you can. You know, they knew, they made it sure that, you know, we're putting someone uh, to watch over this body. They made sure, you know, no one can come and take it. You know, no one's going to take, roll away the stone. They, they, they hired um, a watch, they're setting a watch. But let's see what happens in, um, in Matthew 28. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So these watches, these keepers, you know, they saw the angel of the Lord and they were, sh- they were so scared, they were shaken. You know, they, they, I don't know if you've ever, I've never had an experience myself, but they were, so fair, they were so scared that they passed out. You know, you've seen those roller coaster videos where sometimes... Um, uh, there's one called a slingshot, right? Like uh, there's like a person here and a person here. They're strapped in. They're doing a fake countdown, right? They're good. 10, 9, 8, 7, and boof, right? But you see sometimes in these videos where you're like, ah, and then people are like just passing out like, oh, right? It's, it's, you know, they were so scared. You know, that's what happened to this keeper. You know, he, he, he did shake and became his dead man. You know, they saw the angel of the Lord and they were so scared. And so obviously what did they do? Um, they, they went back, back to the Pharisees. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while you slept. When they were supposed to be made sure that that wasn't going to happen, you know, they were hired so that it wouldn't happen. Yet it happened because Jesus Christ, no one can hold him, not even the grave. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money, the hush money, and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So, you know, the whispers and the, the, all the, 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 you know, the rumors started spreading out. You know, this is what happened. You know, Jesus rose again. It was going everywhere. It wasn't just the disciples. It was even the people uh, that were obviously non-believers hearing this. That Jesus rose from the dead. You know, as Christians, the resurrection story should be something that we're, we, back, uh, we back strongly. Now, this is why the Bible is true. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know, Pilate told him, make, make, it, make it sure as you can. You know, and yet, they couldn't. They couldn't. So, the resurrection, so important and critical. And that should be a proof to us. And uh, once again, it shows us in Jonah, as we were, we're talking about, you know, how God was uh, proven in, in the Old Testament as he's going through the Old Testament. Um, another thing I wanted to pick up on in terms of uh, the, in, in the prophets um, says this in, um, about Jesus Christ, his name. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. So this is filled in Hosea, which we'll get to soon, but um, this is regarding Jesus Christ. And the Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. But thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. 
And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve thee. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. And um, so that is just a picture of what Jesus Christ is uh, in Exodus, but also in Hosea, it talks about this in Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, uh, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, what I want to draw from this is that, you know, what was um, Israel like to the Egyptians, right? You remember, I don't know if you know the, the movies, right? You've seen the movies where um, the Israelites, the Hebrews at the time, they were on hard bondage, right? They're getting, um, they're made, made to work harder under the Egyptians. And so they're like servants. They're like um, bond servants, like slaves in a sense. You know, what I, the picture I have is like of Jesus Christ here in, that, in, in Philippians 2. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but it made himself, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So that's the picture and idea that I have, how Christ, in that sense, fulfilled Hosea, fulfilled Exodus, um, that Israel being called out of Egypt, as we see in Matthew. Out of Egypt have I called my son. So moving on, uh, another one is uh, his name, Emmanuel, right? Isaiah in, in the prophets. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, and we'll just quickly go through this as I'm going to run out of time, maybe. But it says this in Matthew 7, oh, Matthew 1, sorry. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophet, uh, pro spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now once again, false Christ's False people that claim to be Christ, they cannot do this. They cannot say, I am God with my, their name, right? Tyler Docker can't do that. So we see that fulfilled. Um, and why I think it's Emmanuel or Jesus Christ, if you think about it, there's uh, what Jesus is, for he shall save his people from their sins. And one of the things is what we see in Isaiah, it says in Isaiah 40, and, uh, verse 3 and 11, it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. Ethiopia and Seba for thee. And it says in verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So if we jump back to um, Matthew 7, 21, for he shall save his people from their sins. There is no Savior besides Jesus. There is no Savior besides God. There's only one Savior, one Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's why it can be interpreted as uh, God with us, because there is no one else. There is no other God. There is no other Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why it's Emmanuel. Um, I'll go quickly through this. There's also a fulfillment of John the Baptist in the Bible. Uh, that there was someone that was making straight, uh, making the way, preparing the way of the Lord for Jesus Christ, right? So it says this in Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And in, in concerning John the Baptist, um, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight in the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So John the Baptist um, he was preparing the way of Jesus Christ. And he was not that light, but he was going to be sent for the, to preach for the light. So it says this in John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So once again, no one that's a false Christ can say, I had someone come before me to preach for me. No one can do that. Jesus Christ can, because there was John the Baptist who uh, prepared and made straight the way for the Lord. All right, so what I have here, the thought is, as Christians, as believers, um, we ought to be the light as well. It talks about this in Matthew 5, 13 uh, onwards. It says, oh, let's just jump to 14 for sake of time. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Why? And glorify your God, your Father, which is in heaven. So as Christians, you know, does your workplace know that you're a Christian? Or do they know because you, you say it? But do they see you live it? You know, wherever you are, your friends, your family, the parties that you have with the other family members, do they know that you're a Christian? Do they know when they see you, they hear your name, that you're, you're a Christ? Are you shining your light to the world today? Are you like John the Baptist? You're not the light, but you're giving it to Jesus Christ. 
You know, we ought to, why should we shine our light? To glor- so Jesus Christ, to glorify our Father which is in heaven. So that's uh, what I want to draw in regards to the prophets. Um, and I want to quickly go through this one. Jesus in the Psalms. Because if you remember in, in, in Luke 24, 27, it says, in the beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So Psalms isn't mentioned here. And um, just for sake of time, I'm just going to quickly skip through this. He's going to, Jesus Christ is now going to the disciples. And, um, and basically what he do, does, uh, the same thing. He, he, he says in verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. So we did that. And in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So we'll quickly go through a few through, uh, few through and uh, draw some applications here. So in the Psalms, we see Jesus Christ also. Uh, Psalms 110 verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we see um, Melchizedek shown once again in Psalms. Uh, it says this in, and we've already gone through Melchizedek, so we won't go through too much there. So Psalm 78. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in, in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old from the foundation of the world. So we see this in, um, as Jesus, prophet, uh, prophetically speaking about Jesus Christ. And all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. So he spoke in parables. As we see there I will, in verse 2, I will open my mouth in, parable, in a parable. And without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. All right, so moving on, Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. We see this fulfilled in Matthew 27, 46. And Jesus, and, sorry, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So we see, see that fulfilled. Once again, no other false Christ can do this. No other false Christ can say, you know, I am, from, I am God. They cannot go and see, fulfill scripture like this. And Psalm 22 has a lot of uh, prof- uh, prophetic um, things about Jesus Christ. You know, he, that tr- he trusted in the Lord, and we'll go through a lot of Psalm 22. He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted him. We see this in Matthew 27, 43. He trusted in God, let him deliver him, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Once again, Matthew, uh, Psalms 22, 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. And so, uh, t- shows this in John 19, 37, in terms of um, them being pier- him being pierced. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Um, Psalm 22, another one, verse 18. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. John 19 shows us this, that they said them therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Who sh- whose it shall be, that the scripture might be filled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. So a lot of uh, prophetic statements in Psalms, and Jesus once again showing from the Psalms, this is me. You know, and so the... The application I wanted to draw was, you know, you think about what Psalms is. It's like a songbook, right? Uh, we speak to ourselves uh, in Psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, as the Bible verse here says. Um, and that's what Psalms is. You know, it's, music is something that's important, right? We think about what music does in our lives. You know, if I had to choose between music or, or videos and, mu- and movies or something, I would instantly choose music. You know, a lot of us would love music, right? We are just, it's embedded with our lives, you know, you can't help it. Sometimes you're singing in the shower. Sometimes you, you think about the music. Like, you, you just hear a tune in the background. And you just start, like, for whatever reason, you know, you just start, like, you know, bobbing, right? Like, or you, like, you start waving, like, oh, that's a nice song. The music is just indwelled in our lives, embedded into us. Um, it says this in Ephesians 5. Um, and this is why I think also partly why Jesus shows in Psalms. And Christ is one that uh, gave us songs and music. Uh, Sorry, so let's continue. Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Um, And, you know, it doesn't have a comma there. Sorry, it doesn't have a full stop there. It continues the thought. How to be filled with the Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So music, how to be filled with the Spirit? Um, 
sing, you know, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, um, all, the, all the times that, if you've ever been to a workplace where, you know, there's no music in the background, sometimes it feels a bit slow, sometimes it feels like, you know, something's missing, right? You know, when I was in work placement in year, uh, I think it was in year 11 or year 12, I was in work placement for a primary school where I had to send out these end of term school letters. I was putting envelopes uh, for four hours straight. So the first two hours, you know, it was just me like putting envelopes in and um, it was a bit slow. I felt like something like, oh man, like this is so tedious, so like thing. But then, they, then the radio went on and it just made it felt like a quicker, you know, it felt, felt lively. And that's the same with us, you know, we're all musical beings, you know, we all have uh, something that we're attuned to, that we, the songs we like, the songs we listen to, you know, sometimes when you're down, um, you hear a song, you know, like, this uplifts your spirit, you know. And, you know, for those that don't like music or don't want to hear things, it, it sort of reminds me of, like, uh, if you remember the story where S David, he went to Saul, and he was trying to play the harp, but Saul was so angry about David, you know, he wanted to throw a javelin at him, a spear. You know, that, that's sort of what people are like when they don't want to have any music or don't want to have anything to do with the sound at the time. You know, they're always grumpy. They're like, oh, you know, turn that off. Or like, they're always angry. But when you feel, uh, when, you, you, when, you're, when you like songs, when you like uh, hymns and spiritual songs, you know, you just feel something. You just feel, uh, right? Especially like when we sing uh, hymns that we like here and we sing it nice and loud, you know, you feel something great. There's something about songs. There's something about hymns and spiritual songs, you know? And that's why I think Jesus Christ, it shows us also in Psalms as, as the biggest book in the Bible, Psalms. And not only just song, Psalms, you know, we just think of Psalms and Song of Solomon's. You know, Moses also, he wrote some um, songs. You know, he really brought the house down, you know, like in Exodus. He, 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 when he made his song, I think it's in Exodus 15, you know, you got, go towards the end of the song, you know, you see Miriam, you know, she, had, she got her timbrels, her and her ladies and started dancing like, praise the Lord, thank God, you know. So Moses, you know, forget Kanye, you know, it's Moses, right? So Mo Moses had that in Exodus, you know, in Deuteronomy. And also he's accredited to one of the Psalms. I think it was Psalm 90. I can't remember which Psalm. But Moses, you know, you think of someone great for God. He was a, mu a musical being, you know. Even David, you know, someone who was a warrior, someone that was great for, um, that uh, did great things for God after God's own heart. He was, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. Psalms, he, many of it was attributed to him, you know. We as people, as, as um, Christians, you know, we ought to, um, be filled with the Spirit by singing, speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And don't be filled with the, the worldly garbage, you know, that they have fornication and debauchery. You know, we ought to think, sing ourselves with, for God, for Christ. You know, when you wake up, you know, put on a song about Jesus Christ. Put on a hymn. Put on a spiritual song. Not something of the world. You know, pump yourself up with, with, uh, with um, the things of God. You know, uh, and and you have that thought also, what, what is the, when, when, when Satan was created, right? You know, he had all the precious stones. He also had, uh, I think it's the timbrets, the timbrets and, the, and the pipes. So Satan, the devil, Lucifer, was a, is a musical being. You know, he, we, what do we call uh, music sometimes? Like, you know, the art of music, right? And we think of it as an art form. Christ, um, the, the devil, though, he, he knows music. He is the deceiver. He can deceive us. And in one way, it could be, through music, you know, that's why when you sing or you listen to songs, it should be pure, it should be holy, it should be of Jesus Christ, um, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so music's just so important and, and, and embedded to us, um, you know, there's nothing you can do to escape music, you know, we should ought to fill ourselves, you, you think about sometimes when you, I've seen a video where, um, just for, for their point and the, the sake of the video was like, you know, they change the horror scene and they change it to nice music and it just completely changes the, the scene. Like, you, you're not scared anymore. You, you started just watching it like, what am I watching? You know, so music itself is so powerful and that's why we ought to guard ourselves and be filled with the Spirit by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not to things of this world, you know. So, um, I also have this mind where, um, you know, every country has their, their theme. You know, they have their own um, not only nation, uh, what's it, anthem, but sometimes you have, um, you know, the common people, they'll, have, they'll, they'll start the, singing their own songs, you know. Um, may, obviously, many Aussies have a few, um, like on, on the side that we can sing, you know, once a jolly swag man, you know, lives by the billabong, you know those kind of songs, right? You know, every, every Australian might know that. 
But as Christians, you know, these are our songs. These are, as a royal priesthood and holy nation, our psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, these are for us. We ought to claim it. We ought to sing it and sing it with uh, passion. We sing it with confidence. Sing it that we can be filled with the Spirit. And so that's the thought and what I want to draw from in terms of Jesus Christ and the Psalms, um, that we as Christians, as, as musical beings, um, and we're aware of what the devil is, you know, he's seeking who he may devour, right? He's going around, and he's a musical being. What to God ourselves, be filled with the Spirit by speaking to ourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So that's all I have for you this morning in terms of what I want to draw from. Um, I just want to conclude there that, you know, Christ, as he's... As, um, He's important, you know, compared to you know, Judaism, that he's not God. We can see that he is God, you know. He fulfills scripture. You know, Islam says he's not God. We can see he's God. He's died. He was buried and rose again. You know, the Quran says he didn't die. How can it not be? So that's why Jesus Christ fulfilling scripture is so important. That everything points to Jesus to be the Savior. And hopefully you learned something this morning, encouraged or uh, motivated, and um, pray will help you, you know. So let's close in prayer right now. All right. Dear God, I just thank you this morning that we can open your word and I just thank you that uh, for what you did for us, that you died on the cross for us, you were buried and rose again. You being a high priest uh, once entered and sprinkled your blood in the mercy seat once and forever. Thank you for giving us that uh, eternal salvation, eternal redemption. And uh, pray you help us this week, um, help us through our troubles, help us through what we struggle with and that we put away things of the flesh that we ought to give you the glory and praise that you deserve. And may all our worship and prayers go to you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Pray for good fellowship and good time and help us to remember what you've done for us and help us to sharpen one another as iron sharpeneth iron. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.